All right, good evening, everyone. We're going to continue our study here. Very excited about this study coming up because uh, really, and the exercise we're going to do today is something we've done before. Uh, I, I did it, or I started to do it last, about two weeks ago, and the video cut off. But I think this is a good exercise to do in the in an exercise of hermeneutics to understand what an author is trying to get across. So we're going to kind of start, we're going to do kind of like a case study, a little exercise. Today will be kind of the core of our class, and we'll see what happens uh, after that. So let's first begin with prayer, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the day that you've given us, Lord, the beautiful weather and all the tremendous blessings you've given us, Lord. Um, to begin with your son Jesus Christ and all the spiritual blessings which are found in your son Jesus Christ Lord the promises of eternal life that you've given us and all of the good things that are yet to come even more than we could ask or think Lord uh, we pray that our minds would be focused on what is important to you and uh, on your kingdom and those things which are above rather than here on earth uh, but we certainly give you thanks, Lord, for those things here that you give us as well, because we know that your word tells us you give us all uh, all good things richly to enjoy, uh, so long as we keep them in proper perspective. Lord, uh, we, we thank you. We pray that you would also be with those who are not here today, uh, that you would help them if they're ill, help them if they're, uh, you know, depressed or if there's any mental concern or spiritual concern. We pray also for this this uh, pandemic that's going on, the COVID-19 business, all this stuff, that uh, you uh, would be glorified through it and that your church would come as a shining light, as a beacon in the dark uh, here during these times, Lord. We pray that you would help us uh, to remain focused and that you'd be glorified and you'd be with us here in our class tonight as we learn how to look into the perfect law of liberty and uh, know what your will is in accordance with your will uh, through diligent study and workmanship, Lord, that we don't need to be ashamed uh, in your sight, rather than by the word that you've given to us, Lord. We thank you and praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> okay. Hey. Hi, guys. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Hi, right, Dick. Uh, we're getting back together. This is, this is good stuff. <laughs> it is good stuff. So exciting. Okay. So we're going to continue what we were looking at last week. And uh, really where we got into is uh, really when it comes to looking at words or phrases or sentences, um, we need to try to keep the, the, the original or the intent of the author in mind. Okay. So whatever the, the author of the book has in mind is what we need to to kind of look at as we try to uh, understand particular words. And I use an example, I think, last week of saying something like, I, you know, I hear loud barking outside. And uh, most people with common sense would understand that to mean there's a dog outside, or at least a person who's barking like a dog, or something that's making a barking sound. You wouldn't, you wouldn't immediately call to your mind some guy out there chipping wood off of a you know, bark off a tree or something and calling it, but you wouldn't do that, all right? So common sense, of course, goes a long way in these kind of things. You know, some of this, we go through this and we might think, yeah, that makes sense, I, I know that. But for the benefit of those who don't, uh, it's good to go through some of these basic steps. Let me get my Bible real quick. Because... It's, uh, there are a lot of people who don't know these things. They don't know how to follow along. They don't know, they, they don't know that the context matters. They don't, they don't really know that, uh, you know, they may not know what the author's intent is. They may not know how to ascertain the author's intent. They may not know, they may not, they have been, may have been taught not to care. Go ahead. Is it possibly because so many places, if they go to, uh, church mm -hmm. they don't get the whole story they don't right. get the whole paragraph there'll right. be a verse here a verse there yeah. so that's the only thing they know about the scripture is verses yeah it's very common very very common for that to happen a lot of times people in fact most of the people i talk to or the people i talk to 
and, and study with, and they're studying with people, and they'll say, hey, you know, I was talking to somebody, and this is what they said. And I'd say, well, that's fine. What they're saying is true <clears throat> as far as what they're saying. For example, uh, for by grace you are saved uh, through faith, right? Is that true? Yeah, it's true. But what does that mean? What's the bigger context? And what is, you know, what's involved in all that, you know? So when you start looking into that, so it's not like, it's not that somebody may come to you and say something that's outright false, but the conclusion they may draw from the passage of Scripture they're looking at might be false. Okay, for example, those who go to Ephesians 2, 8, 9 say, you know, they go to that passage to, to kind of put forth this faith-only doctrine or whatever. And, you know, uh, what, when they read the verse, I applaud them. Yay, that's right. You're reading the Scripture. That's what it says. I believe it. But it has to be placed in its context. It has to be understood in what it actually means. What does that word faith mean? Okay? And that's a very important thing. What does it mean to be saved? Okay, and by the way, there's a there's a, an assault by philosophers calling themselves theologians on the Word of God. Okay, for example, if you go to James, and of course this is a little bit of a sidetrack from a class, but we'll get there. If you go to James chapter two and verse fourteen, it says, "What you know?" Uh, let me let me read this passage exactly because it's important to to know. But it says basically. James. It says this in verse 14 of chapter 2. It says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Okay. Can faith save him? Okay. Now, the question is, it's a rhetorical question in the original language. If you look at the, the structure of the original language, it's a rhetorical question. And we know what that means, right? When I tell you something is rhetorical, that means that I'm expecting an obvious answer. Okay? Well, this is a rhetorical question, and it's expecting an obvious answer, and the obvious answer to the question is no. Okay? So what philosophical people do, or philosophers who pose as theologians, or are masquerading as theologians, what they do is they say, well, James isn't talking about salvific faith. Okay? And they throw this word out, which is, is self-defeating in, in my estimation, because... The word salvific, you ready for what it means? Of or pertaining to salvation. That's what it means. So James is not talking about salvation, salvation. What? Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. Okay? There's only one kind of salvation. <laughs> That's it. You're either saved or not saved. It's saved from God's perspective or not. There's no varying degrees of salvation and, and this and that. No, no. See, that's philosophy. All right? So my point is, when we get into some of these what seems to be more basic studies, it is actually to help us ground ourselves in the understanding of God's Word so that when philosophers who are posing as theologians come our way, we can present to them a solid, firm understanding, a clear understanding of what the Scripture actually says. Because to be honest with you, philosophy can't rise above the dirt and rocks. And what I mean by that is, philosophy likes to say, do I really exist? <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, I don't know. Do you? <clears throat> are you standing here talking to me? If you are, then you exist. You know. So what I'm saying is, philosophy even likes to question even the most basic things. And so when you bring philosophy into theology and you try to commingle the two together, what do you end up with? You end up with people who can't even understand the most basic terms in the scriptures. So that's why these exercises are valuable. Go ahead. You know, um, Brian, the scripture talks about the good soil. And you and I can study with people and we can present a very solid, sound doctrinal argument that the best word is falling on <coughs> bad soil, it ain't going to sink in, and it isn't going to mean anything to them. So my point is, is when we teach people or talk to people, we're not wasting our time to talking to them if they're poor soil, but they're not going to, they're not going to accept or receive what we say with, with how should I say it? 
sincerity unless it's good soil. Right, so here's what's interesting about that, Dick, and I agree with what you're saying. Bad soil doesn't receive the word of God, okay? Particularly if it's wayside. You know, stony ground might receive it for a little while until trouble comes along. And the other, uh, you know, the thorny stuff starts to grow up, but then the cares of the world choke it out, right? right. Well, here's the funny thing. You can take good soil and you can strip it of all its goodness through chemical actions, right? But you can also take bad soil and you can amend it to make good soil, right? So what do you do in the midst of all this? You may, you may be casting seed and the soils around you might be all the first three, who knows? But the thing about it is, if you and I let our light so shine before men, that they see our good works and glorify their Father in heaven, perhaps that'll serve an amendment, serve as an amendment for their soils, so that their soil, once bad, will become good. Well, we're not supposed to judge the soil anyway. We're just supposed right. to cast. We're just, we're just, yeah. But I guess what I'm saying is, even in the event that we know that the people around us hate us, or they don't care, or they're not listening, or whatever, uh, there's still hope that their soil can be amended. Right. So that it receives God's word, okay? And it starts with stuff like this. It really does. This is a basic study today, and I don't expect anybody here to have trouble with it. <laughs> In fact, you guys might think, we've been here before, man. But that's okay. Because it's good to kind of to revisit some of these basic things, okay? So the con the, what we're operating under is the <laughs> construct of always interpreting the word, phrase, or sentence in accordance with the known purpose of the author, okay? For example, John says, in, in, at the end of his book, he says, I write these things that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that you may have eternal life through him. That's what he states is his purpose for writing that, that gospel, if you will. Now, of course, we know that John wrote it, but God inspired it, okay? John didn't just one day wake up and go, you know what? I feel like writing something that makes people believe that Jesus is God, so I'm just going to write it. No, he was inspired by God to do that. Same thing with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and all the other <coughs> writers of the New Testament documents, right? All right. So what happens is when we're looking now, I don't know how much time I'm going to have, and I really want to get to the passage in Acts, but when you look at a passage like John 3, 16, who can quote that for me? Somebody can quote that for me, I bet you. God so loved the Lord that he wanted to be begotten Son of Israel, and he wanted to be begotten Son of Israel, and he wanted to be begotten Son of Israel. Good. Not fair. Yeah, good. Everlasting life. Right, okay, right. That's a big pet peeve, but they use the wrong word. Okay, so here's the thing. That's one verse, right? <clears throat> what about the rest of the verses around it? How about the verse 18 and 19, which talks about unbelief and condemnation <laughs> because men love darkness rather than light? Context. Okay, context, right? What about... Does context extend for and aft? It can. It can, but does it in every case? Should we look for it for and aft? Sure. Yes, we should. Because and here's why that's important, because in John 3, 16, John 3, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 5, 4, 3, all the way up to 1 is part of the context. Because what's happening is in that context, Jesus begins to talk about salvation, doesn't he? You remember what happens in John chapter 3, right? Nicodemus comes along. He's one of the Pharisees. Nicodemus comes along and says, Hey, Jesus, we know that you've come from God because, you know, nobody can do the things that you do unless God is with them. And Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, this is a funny, I've always been, like, struck by Jesus' response because on the surface, his response looks totally disconnected from his statement because he didn't ask a question but he said most assuredly I say to you that unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven what <laughs> wait a minute Nicodemus didn't talk, wasn't saying anything or was he you see what I'm saying almost like the rich young ruler that came up to him and said Jesus what must I do to inherit eternal life he said keep the commandments and he said which one you know, do not steal, do not commit adultery. You know, all these different things he mentioned. He goes, all these things I've done since I was a young, young, what still do I lack? And he said, what? <clears throat> Go and sell all that you have. Give to the poor and come follow me and you'll have 
life, right? And what happened with that rich young ruler? He went away sad, didn't he? Well, Jesus got right to the point. I believe he was doing the same thing with Nicodemus. He said, this is what's required of a person to enter life. This is how you're going to see the kingdom of heaven. Spirit, water and the spirit, right? Okay, go ahead. Just a comment about that verse. Jesus did sell the, or tell the rich, the rich man. Which in Lulu, yeah. Go, go sell what you have and give, give it to the poor. <coughs> Does God say that to every rich person who comes along? No. And does he, he doesn't need to necessarily. The, the, the issue is, is if your riches keep you from doing God's will, then your riches are bad. Yep. You can do God's will and be rich, then rich. No problem with being rich. Exactly. Matter of fact, Jesus... But see, that verse doesn't infer that. It just infers but that everybody's rich, got to get rid of everything in order to be pleasing to God. Well, that's again, good, good point, Nick. Okay, well, I don't agree necessarily that it doesn't infer what it is looking for. I don't necessarily agree with that, but even if you drew that conclusion, that's okay. You know why? Because there's other passages in the scriptures that helps us understand what he's talking about. Like when Jesus talked about the parable of the rich man who had barns and his land yielded plentiful crops, what happened? He said, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And I'll store all my crops and I'll say to my soul, soul, Take your ease, eat and drink and be merry, for you have many much, right? And God said, you fool. Why? Because this night your soul's going to be required of you. Then, whose will all this be? And so it is with those who are rich and are not rich toward God. Okay? So when you compare passages and God's mindset on that, you get a clearer picture of it. Which is, by the way, inductive study, which is part of this class. You know, you inductively study the scriptures. That's how you come about a proper... Even if you did draw that conclusion over here, you could say, well, is he saying that? I don't know. Let's compare that in that local context with the totality of the scriptures or the remote context of the New Testament or whatever. Make sense? <clears throat> okay. So, always interpret according to the known purpose of the author. Uh... What if you don't know? What if you don't know the who the what the purpose is? What do you do? Okay, we're going to address this a little bit later. All right. There are times when the purpose of the author is not explicitly stated. Okay. For example, this is why I wanted to go to Acts chapter one, because in Acts chapter one we have a a good example of a statement, but it doesn't necessarily tell us what he's trying to accomplish necessarily in the beginning okay in Luke chapter 1 who wants to open up Luke for me Luke chapter 1 and uh, start in verse 1 and just read until it, the purpose of Luke is is uh, understood and as much as many have taken in hand to set in order in narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us <coughs> those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Okay, so there's the reason why he wrote Luke. Why was Luke written? So people would know. To present a most uh, um, orderly account so that people would know what's going on, right? That's the stated purpose of the book of Luke, okay? He writes it to somebody named Theophilus, all right? You look at Acts chapter 1, it begins this way. It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit and given commandments to the apostles, okay? So here we see that there is a... The, the writer of Acts, whether we want to conclude it was Luke or not, okay, we'll, we're not going to get into that tonight because the, we'd have to examine the evidence for the book of Luke being written by Luke. But here's what we can know. We can know that the book of Acts was written by the same person who wrote the book of Luke. Okay? Because he says, in Luke, it's written to Theophilus. Here, he's referencing the former account I made uh, to Theophilus. 
about what Jesus began both to do and to teach, okay, which is, by the way, another word of saying, another way of saying the gospel or the, the account that he wrote, which would be the book of Luke, okay? Um, and of course, you can read through the book of Luke and find out that he's writing all about what Jesus taught and did and until he was resurrected. I mean, until he was uh, taken up uh, from the apostles' sight, okay? But listen to this. Here's what we're going to do right now. And we're going to do this uh, so long as we have enough class time. We should be done with it by the end of class. I hope so because I don't want to pick this up here in the middle of this next week, okay? But what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the fact that Luke says here what he wants to do is set an account here also. In other words, if this is written by Luke and Luke was written by Luke, that book was written to give an accurate account of certain things. What Jesus did, what Jesus taught, and all that stuff. The book of Acts is written by Luke to give an orderly account of what happened when the church began. Okay? And the history of the church, and the acts of the apostles during the formation of the church. That's what you could say Acts would, or Luke would be doing here. It's almost like a continuation. And actually, if you ever... If you wanted to, you should try this. Try reading from Luke chapter 1 all the way through Acts chapter uh, 24, uh, 28, 28 chapters. Go, go, just read straight through, and you'll see that it's almost like an unbroken chain, sort of, because you have the end of the gospel, which picks right up here, in the, right here in Acts chapter 1. Jesus, what is happening here is Luke is backing up a little bit into his gospel, when he recorded that they were t that Jesus was taken up, right here he's backing up in Acts chapter one and going, okay, let's zoom in on that last minute or two with the Lord and see what happened right there. And then from that point on, you have what what, what occurs in, as far as the church beginning. Okay, so that's what we're having here, and I want us to all do this. You don't have to do this quite as tedious as we've done in the past, but for the sake of those who would be watching on on video. I want to make sure that we go through this so that they would understand it, okay? So in your mind, and if you feel like it, you can say it out loud, it doesn't really matter. Every time we see a pronoun, I want us to replace it with the noun that it stands for, okay? So when we go through this, it says, the former account I made. Now, again, I'm not going to go through and go through the, the proof of, of Luke. It's too much time for this class. But let's just say for the sake of assumption right now for this one pronoun that it's talking about Luke, okay? The former account I, Luke, made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus, there's the proper noun, right? Jesus, began both to do and to teach until the day in which he, Jesus, was taken up after he, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles. There's another um, proper noun, uh, standing for the apostles, whom he Jesus. had chosen, to whom he Jesus. presented himself Jesus. alive after his Jesus. suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them. The apostles. Very good. The apostles. During 40 days, and speaking of these things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, yeah, Jesus commanded, or he, sorry, I filled it in. <laughs> I'm just so used to doing that now. He Jesus. commanded them, the apostles, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said. Jesus. Now hold on a minute. God. God, that's right. The Father. That's right. You. You. Jesus. It would be the apostles. You have heard from me. No. God the Father. For John truly baptized with water. But you, apostles, shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Stop there for a minute. Okay? Stop there for just a second. If you, somebody turn back to Matthew chapter 3 for me. And uh, I forget exactly what verse it is. It's where John starts talking about, uh, you know, baptizing Jesus. And I baptize you with, with water, but there's one who comes after me whose sandals. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what verse that is. 
If somebody could look that up for me. Matthew chapter 3. It's in chapter 3. Let's see here. Oh, let's see here. It's in... 3.11? Yeah, it's uh, verse... Yeah, 11. I am he baptized you with water under repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barns, and he will burn up the chaff with his question of fire. He, he is, is Jesus in this context. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 1, you'll notice that Jesus is applying what John said to the apostles. Okay? Anytime you have that, you have an inspired account as to what that means. Okay? In other words, you wonder, what does it mean for John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, who's talking in Acts chapter 1? Jesus is talking. No, Luke is recording it. Okay. But Jesus is talking. Who is he talking to? The apostles. The apostles, right? Jesus is talking to the apostles. And he said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they, the apostles, the apostles had come together, they asked him, Jesus. saying, yes, Lord Jesus, will you... Jesus. At this time, restore the kingdom to Israel. And he, Jesus, Jesus said to them, the apostles. Right. It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his, the, Father. the Father's own authority, but you, the apostles, yep, shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The apostles. Okay. And you the apostles. shall be witnesses to me Jesus. in Jerusalem. And in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Okay, stop there for just a second. One thing to put to put to, to make sure this is clear. That word witness is mature, which means it's the same word for um, it's the same word for messenger. No. <laughs> Hello. It's the same word for martyr. Okay. But how do you know if he's saying you're going to be a martyr here in Jerusalem or something else? Well, a person cannot be a martyr in one place and another and another and another, right? So chances are, contextually, it's not talking about that because another definition for the word is witness, okay? Now, this, the, the key about this is it is a witness, meaning an eyewitness, okay? You are going to be eyewitnesses of me, what I've done among you in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world, okay? Which, by the way, later on in Acts chapter 1, we'll see that they chose someone to be with them who had to be with them from the baptism of John to when he was taken up. Why? Because he was going to be a witness. Okay? He was going to be an apostle and as a witness of Jesus Christ. There are no witnesses today. Anybody seen Jesus Christ? No. Anybody seen the acts he's done? No. So when people use the word, I'm going to go witnessing, that's actually a very bad thing to say. Because biblically speaking, they can't do that. Now what they can do is go out and share the testimony of God's word. Okay? But they can't go out witnessing in the same sense that they find here. Question? Yes. I mean, I can understand because understanding verses when we pretty much when it switches from one to the other. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm not following like when you start in verse 4. Yeah. Like it says, the Father, which he, see, it goes back to, to they're talking to the Father. Right. But then like when you get to verse 6. Yeah. And ask him, not with Jesus, right? Yes. How do we know yes. that the he and the him changed from God to Jesus in that particular point? Because the him there ties back to me. The him ties back to me. He said, you have heard from me, Jesus. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, who was speaking? Okay, I thought they said that me was God, not Jesus. No, no, the me, the Father, he said, he, the Father, okay. which you have heard of me, Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who's going to send the, send the Holy Spirit, remember? 
Yeah. John chapter 12, John chapter 14, 15, and 16 talks all about the fact that Jesus, when he goes away, is going to send a comforter. Sometimes okay. you say that the me was God. That's what confusing me. Sometimes oh, yeah, no, that wasn't. You agreed with that. I'm sorry, I missed this quote. That's okay. That's, okay. That's why yeah. Christmas. The me is Jesus, which you have heard from me. I'm, I made a mistake there. Sorry. But yes. Okay, but remember when it says, "Therefore, when they had when they had come together, who are the they? The apostles. the apostles, right? That's always the same. Okay, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel?' And he said to them, "Remember, if you can't find, if you if you get confused on the pronouns a little bit, remember who's talking and who he's talking to." Okay, there was a reference made to the Father. Because the Father made the promise. Okay? But the context is Jesus talking to the apostles. So he said, Father, which he said that he was the Father, correct? Yes. Which you have father, heard you of have me. Heard from me. Which I, I almost can see that the, the Father said, you have heard from me. Yeah, I don't think that's... I don't want to get hung up there. Now, this is where it gets confusing when you change it. Something like that. I don't know which one. Sure. Is. But what I'm saying is yeah. that if you look... Okay, if you read the whole thing... Okay, let me read it from verse 4 to verse 7. And being together, uh, being assembled together with them, the apostles, he, Jesus, commanded them, the apostles, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, notice the quotes, he said, who's talking? Jesus is talking, yes. talking about someone who made a promise, which is the Father, who said, You have heard from me. And the way I can understand that is you can either understand that as Jesus or God, but contextually, if you look at it, it Jesus goes on. In other words, the 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 quotation goes on for John truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now okay now that's God's that's the father speaking right because it's a quotation do you see it and being assembled together with them he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father which he said who's 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 the he God. The Father. Okay? Now watch. So now we're, we're talking about the Father. Jesus is telling them to wait for wait in Jerusalem for the power on high, which God said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water. Now, I think I understand what's happened here. Mm -hmm. I was right the first time. <laughs> Not the second. The first, it's still talking about God. Because God, remember at the baptism of John, who spoke? God spoke. Not the bapt baptism of Jesus by John's hand. I have to make sure I get this right. God spoke. God spoke, which he has heard, you have heard from me, right? John truly baptized with water, but you, the apostles, the apostles right, shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, so he's talking about, he's talking at that time, telling them to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me, right? John baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, Jesus is informing them of this. So then when the quotes end, and then it goes to verse 6, and as him, that means to him, now I'm going back to Jesus. Therefore, when they, the apostles, had come together, they asked him, Jesus. They wouldn't be asking the Father in a dialogue. And the quotes would have come from God, but after that, it would come, to come from the apostles, and Jesus' answers would be in his quotes also. Yeah. So, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Jesus. They, being the apostles, asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you, Jesus... At this time, restore the kingdom of Israel. And he said to them, Surely this is not God from heaven speaking to them. Who's talking? Jesus. Jesus is talking, okay? He said to them, It is not for you, the apostles, 
to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, okay? The Father, right? But you, apostles, shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, the apostles, and you, apostles, shall be witnesses to me, Jesus. That's right. In Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, when he, Jesus, Jesus had spoken these things while they watched, the apostles. Okay, he Jesus. was taken up and a cloud received him Jesus. out of their the apostles. sight. And while they looked steadfast, I'm sorry, I skipped one. While they, the apostles, Look steadfastly towards heaven as he, Jesus, right, went up. Behold, two men stood by them, the apostles, in, exactly, in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which, by the way, tells us who that's talking about, who has taken up from you, apostles, men of Galilee, apostles, into heaven will also will so come in like manner as you saw him Jesus. go into heaven. Okay, so still talking about the apostles and Jesus. Okay, that's pretty much what's going on here. Okay, then they, the apostles, the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount of, called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they the had entered, they the apostles went up into the upper room where they were staying. Now, if we have any doubt as to who they are, look at the list. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alpha, Al Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These, the apostles. these all apostles, these are the eleven, right? All continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. Now, these all continue one prayer and supplication, right? With the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Okay? So now we've got more people there. This is where people start getting like, uh oh, uh oh, where's the where's the pronouns going? Now listen. And in those days, notice, it doesn't say it's the same day. It says in those days, right? During this time period. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of whom? The disciples. Altogether, the names, uh, the number of the names was about 120, and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us. Who is he? Judas. Judas was numbered with us. Who is the us? The apostles. The apostles, absolutely. Okay, not talking about all the disciples. It's talking about those 11 that are left. Okay? Okay, us. And obtain a part in this ministry. What ministry? The apostleship. Okay, we're going to know that because later on he says Matthias is going to take part in the apostleship. We'll, we'll just wait till we get there. Now, this man, which we don't have to actually have to read this part if we don't want to, but if you guys want me to, I will. It says, now this man, this man being Judas, mm -hmm. purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he, Judas, burst open in the middle and all his, Judas, entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in there, all those dwelling in Jerusalem, Language, Akaldamo, that is filled with blood. For it is written in the book of the Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, Judas, and let no one live in it, and let another take his Judas. office. Judas's office. What was Judas's office? He was an apostle. He was an apostle. Okay, so we know that this is talking about replacing Judas as an apostle. So Peter is talking to the disciples that are all gathered around, about 120, I think he said, gathered together. He's saying, from this group of people, we need to select one that's going to take this Judas's place. Okay? Therefore, verse 2, 21, I mean, 
of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out in and out in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day when he Jesus. was taken up from us. Apostles. The apostles, that's right. Remember, he was taken up from the sight of whom? The apostles. The apostles. All those disciples weren't there. Jesus was there with his his apostles. Okay? So that's how we know this us is still talking about the apostles, not all of the disciples. Okay? One of these must become a witness with us. The apostles. I'll tell you why that's the case in a minute. Of his resurrection. And they proposed to. Now here is another one that I'm not exactly sure with. It could be that this was 120 disciples who proposed to, to Joseph and Matthias. Or the apostles did. I don't know. That's the problem because the, the, this, this kind of thing, the antecedent, could go up to the disciples. They proposed to. Okay? Joseph called Bar Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, now listen, I know who this they is. Let's say Paul. This is the apostles, and here's why. All right? And they, the apostles, prayed and said, You, O Lord, know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you, Jesus, yep, have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he may go to his own place. Judas, of course. And they cast their lots. Who are the they? The apostles. It's the apostles. Those who were praying. Those who were looking for the one to take the place of the apostleship. Right? He said, oh Lord, who knows the hearts of all shown of us to you, you have chosen. Right. Where's that Jesus? Is that Jesus or God? Is he praying it God? says, oh Lord. Oh Lord, they referenced Lord earlier. I mean, it could be the Father or... It, the way that I understand this, because they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're using the same address. So it seems to me that they're asking Jesus, because Jesus is the one who appoints the apostles. Okay? Lord is not a pronoun, though. So that's not actually part of what we're talking about. No, that Lord, already. Lord is not a pronoun. Mm -hmm. Lord is a title. So it could be talking about Jesus or the Father. I don't think it matters. Okay, so, all right, so here it says, now listen, and they cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he, Matthias, was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, here's the key to all this. Who, where does verse 26 end? It says, Matthias, and he was numbered with what? With the 11 apostles. With the 11 apostles, okay? That's the, that's the noun that we're going to be focusing on. Now look what chapter 2 says, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with all one accord. Who are they? The apostles. What is the nearest antecedent? Okay, the apostles, right? Antecedent is the thing that, that precedes it, okay? All right, so the nearest antecedent in this case is the apostles, the 11 apostles. I think we have to remember that man was the one that put the chapter breaks in, not Luke. Of course. So, I mean, but you still have a period there, so you're not yeah. just going to read it like a run-on run -on sentence, you know. Yeah. But when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, the 11, or the 12 apostles, actually, because the 11 plus Matthias, 12 apostles, were with all one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they, the apostles, were sitting. Then there appeared to them the apostles. the apostles, divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. The apostles. Exactly. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they the apostles. Okay, were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the apostles. utterance. Okay, now, for the rest of this, I'm not going to go quite so slowly, but my point in all this is you can see that when you follow the pronouns and you look in the context of something, you can see that Jesus was talking to his apostles.
minus Judas, right? Telling them that they were to receive power from on high as a promise made to them from the Father, which John spoke about, <laughs> okay, earlier. Jesus was applying to the apostles. They're going to receive the Holy Spirit, right? They were going to be witnesses to him in Jer Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the world, right? Then what happened on the day of Pentecost? Who received the Holy Spirit? You mean who received the, the, the tongues of fire? Well, contextually... The through the tongues of fire. No, Dick, I'm saying who received the power from on high from the Holy Spirit, baptism the of the Holy Spirit? The apostles. That's right. Now, who was it promised to? The apostles. Was it ever promised to you or me? Were we there with Jesus in Jerusalem? Were we among the number of the you shall receive power from on high? No. We weren't there. We were never meant to be part of the promise of Acts chapter 1. Okay? We are part of the promise in Acts chapter 2. Okay? Go ahead. The, the issue, you know, I, I'm aware of the Pentecostals or some group of people wanting to, or having the, these spiritual gifts and having the gifts of tongues and all this other stuff. They're referring to themselves as part of this group of 120. But you'll have to admit that when we started in the book of Acts, it was talking about the apostles. But mixed in with going from the apostles, we went to 120 people, then we back to the apostles again. Mm -hmm. So you can see where people can get that. Oh, yeah. When they when they transition from the apostles to the 120 and then back to the apostles again, people have to be paying attention or they're going to think they're talking about the 120 all the way to the end of verse chapter 1. Yes, and that's, not. but that's why. That is my, that is my, my point. <laughs> that's actually my point. My point is, this takes effort. You can't just assume. You can't say, well, I think it's the 120 disciples. Well, that doesn't matter what you think or what I think. What does the Bible say? How can we look through and discern through the context who he's talking about and what's being said? Go ahead. I would say any book you would read, you'd have to do this to understand it. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Right, but most books are read like novels and don't really care. Yeah. They don't really have any lasting impact on our lives. I know. You know, the Bible... They can really get confusing if you don't pay attention. So people, yeah. that's what they're talking about. So people with especially with the mystery, you have to pay attention to certain things, and or the book would be fun to read. So if you can do it with that, you should do it with something more important. Right. Well, it's yeah. if people think it's important, you know. Here, my point. Here's my point, though. This is how you can determine what the author is trying to get across. Okay. This is an example of it. This is a this is a um, a case study, and how can you go through the scriptures? And know that you can know what the author is trying to get across. Okay? And you go through this. And a pronoun study, by the way, is only one way. There's other ways, too. You can go through preposition uh, studies, too. Where, you know, you can look at in, at, of, about, unto, all that kind of stuff. There's all kinds of ways you can do this. All right? But my point in, in today's exercise is to show us that Luke who was a very meticulous writer. He was a doctor by trade, if you will, by profession. He was a doctor, and he wrote Luke to give an accurate accounting of Jesus' life, which, by the way, is the longest book in the New Testament, the book of Luke is. Okay? So he's very meticulous and very detail-oriented when he writes what he writes. And so when you come over here to the book of Acts, you can see that that meticulous nature continues into this so that when we look at the purpose of the writer of the book of Acts is to tell us what happened after Jesus ascended well this is the very beginning of it this is he ascended what they do they waited in Jerusalem they hung out around the upper upper room because in those days they were up in the upper room <laughs> okay so the the whole reason for the 120 disciples by the way the entire reason that's listed here is for no other reason than to show that there were a group of people from which the apostle was going to be chosen. That's it. That's the only reason they showed that. Let me bring up the fly in that ointment. In which ointment? There's 120 in. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all what, the time. What verse are you reading? Verse 21, chapter 1. Verse 21? Yeah. Okay. Of all these men, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John okay. to that day when he was taken up from us. Uh huh. Okay, when he ascended into heaven, correct? Yes. And up to verse 9, now when he had spoken these things while they watched, and the, the they was the apostles, yeah. he was taken up and the cloud received him out of their sight, the apostles. The only ones who were with him at the ascension that saw him do this were, were the, the apostles. apostles. Mm -hmm. The eleven. Yeah. So where are they getting this guy that was with them to that day when he was taken up? It says nobody, there was no other witnesses of the ascension. Well, remember this. It doesn't say that he had to be a witness of the ascension. And it doesn't, if you look at the text, it says from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up. That's why I said another part of the study that you could be prepositions because if it was unto the day it could have been right up until the point where he called his apostles and gave them in other words up to that day okay and okay. then he was taken up they're supposed to be witnesses of the resurrection which occurred beforehand these guys this group of people would be among the 500 brethren mentioned in first corinthians chapter 15 okay if you look at first corinthians chapter 15 It says in verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was ro rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, which are the apostles, right? Mm -hmm. After that, he was t seen by over 500 brethren at once. Okay. What verse did you just read? That was verse, uh, six. Sorry. verse 6, yeah. 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. 15, yes. yeah, 5 and 6. Uh, after that, he was seen by 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained present, but some had fallen asleep. All right, so these 120 disciples would have come, in from, would have come from that number of people, these 500 brethren. That's why he says, men and brethren, we need to choose from these people. That's why I said, some of these things... When you start looking at, when he says they prayed, okay, could it be that they all prayed together? Yes. But when you get into things where you know that the antecedent is talking about the apostles, you, like for example, in chapter 2, when it says, when the day of fully Pente uh, Pentecost had fully come, they were with well, all one accord in one place. Who was, the, who was the day? It's not the 120 disciples. Because they, it's the apostles. Okay, so it, during that transition, I can see how it would get a little hazy. Okay, and in some instances, when you're talking about they prayed, well, who was it that cast lots? Not the 120 disciples. The apostles did. So the same people who prayed are the same people who cast lots. Okay, because of the way the structure is in the sentence. When, when they prayed, they cast lots. And the lot fell on Matthias. Okay, so that is the same group of people. One day and the other day are the same group of people. So you know that if it's 120 people, among whom Matthias and Justice were numbered, that means they would be casting lots for themselves also. In other words, you'd have to have 120 people plus the 11 casting lots. That's like casting dice. I don't think that's the way it worked. Okay, N knowing what I know about the way they did things and how they went about it, highly unlikely you're going to have 120 people casting lots. All right. So my point is, sometimes it can get like, well, we're shifting gears here, but you can still make your way through it. Okay. When you look at the whole context, what was the point of the 120 disciples? To choose. To choose two men. To see which one would fill the office of the apostleship. That's the point of the 120 disciples. 
Okay, that's it. That was the pool from which they were pool, yeah. drawn. Yeah, they needed need, okay. they need to draw that this fossil from somebody. Exactly. They couldn't draw it from the thin from air. Fossils <laughs> right. You know, they, yeah, the fossils. Right. Right. Yeah. It's interesting to notice too, uh, Brian, that in verse six it says, "After that, he was seen by over five hundred brethren." At once. Mm -hmm. I never saw those space. I've seen those two words before. Yep, that's why I At said once. that. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. And I don't know what the significance of that is, but well, the the significance of that would be look, his his resurrection is highly attested, and all these people saw it all at once. Some of them have died, but most of them are still around. Yep. And that's where I'm convinced this group of 120 doesn't. Not that it really matters. The point is, and to to your not really a can of worms. I mean, the language says from this time up to this point. Okay? Did they witness his ascension? Doesn't say they did. Okay? But it can mean. But didn't say it was necessary either. Exactly. <laughs> didn't say it was necessary either. They would have they had, been there to witness the ascension. Or they the would have said they had to be there from the baptism through the witnessing of the ascension. It doesn't say that says they were to witness the resurrection and they did the 500 brethren saw him all at once you know that kind of thing so that's how and by the way this is how you put together inductive studying this is this is a good exercise in in accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish all right so i guess my time is up here but um you know you could ask yourself a couple questions as you're reading acts chapter one to whom was the promise of, uh, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit given? Okay. It was given to the apostles. Does the scripture show who actually received the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Yes, it does. Acts chapter 2. Okay. All right. In, I put it here. If we do not carefully study the sentences and phrases in this context, we can, like, we can make it believe we can say whatever we want. We can say... It was the 120 disciples. You can say it was undefined. We can say that it includes everybody who's supposed to be, but that's not the that's not the case. Remember, they Jesus spoke with them, gave them a promise that the Father made actually to them, right? They were subject to that promise. Now, the only other place in all of the New Testament that we have another person being baptized in the Holy Spirit is Cornelius and his household. That's it. And the purpose is also given there, okay? Here, it's for the apostles to preach the gospel so that signs and wonders will follow them, confirming the word, Mark chapter 16, okay? In Acts chapter 10, it was to prove to the Jews that the Gentiles would receive the grace of God as well. That's it. Everybody else is subject to Acts chapter 2. Because, and how, how do I know that? Well, in Acts chapter 2... In verse 38, it says, when they asked, what must we do in the middle of Peter's preaching this sermon, right? Which, by the way, is being heard in all the different tongues. He said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's our promise. Okay. For the promise is to you and to your children and, uh, and to all who are far off, which, by the way, is a term a lot of times for Gentiles. Not just because usually the Jews were called close and the Gentiles far. Okay, another study. He says, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. He called you, he called me by the gospel. So this promise is to you and me. This, Acts chapter 2, the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's our promise. Holy Spirit baptism, not our promise. <laughs> okay, make sense? All right, any other questions? No? Okay. Well, we will pick up um, point four here. How do we determine the purpose of the author next week? All right? Okay. Good class. Let me hang on.